Hi, this is John Potter and welcome to session two of Leadership in Action. In this session, we are going to have a look at the qualities, traits and situational approaches to leadership. In this session, we're going to have a look at understanding the qualities, traits and situational approaches to leadership. In many ways, this is the first approach that people took to leadership, trying to work out why some people seem to be effective leaders and why others were not so effective as leaders. So now looking at slide two, let's think what we mean by leadership qualities. In fact, the earliest approaches to understanding leadership ability were all about trying to identify leadership qualities. And there is quite a strong lure to the qualities approach. And people have always been interested in leadership as a process, and in particular, attention for many people intuitively focuses on the issue of leadership qualities. Just what is it about the leader's makeup that enables them to influence others to follow their lead, particularly in difficult times? The qualities approach is very appealing to many people, as it often relates to the production of confidence on the part of those being led, and individuals do seem to like to attribute leadership success to specific characteristics of the leader. One author, John Adair, in his book Effective Leadership, on page 7, and this is in the bibliography at the end of this session, quotes an eminent lecturer, albeit that that lecturer is unnamed, at St Andrews University in 1934, who focuses on this idea, and the lecturer stated, it is a fact that some people possess an inbred superiority which gives them a dominating influence over their contemporaries and marks them out for leadership. This phenomenon is as certain as it is mysterious. Well, during the 20th century, we've progressed from this view, but for many individuals, leadership qualities are still of interest, and they always seem to figure in how leadership effectiveness is measured, even if only in an informal way. So, let's think about our study question. Before moving on to the next slide, give this some thought. What do you believe are the six major leadership qualities that an individual should possess if they are to be an effective leader? So moving on to slide three, let's look at some of the challenges presented with the qualities approach. We're going to just consider the Fortune Business Journal study about leadership abilities, thinking about choosing a new leader, and look at Ralph Stogdill's work in a little bit more detail. For example, does the leader exceed the ability of the average member of the people that they're leading? And then we'll just remind ourselves that Stogdill pointed to the importance of the situation in determining the most appropriate set of qualities for a leader. Well, in his book, Effective Leadership, which we've already referred to in the earlier slide, John Adair points out to a study carried out by Fortune magazine, an American business journal, which featured a questionnaire survey of 75 top executives and their views on appropriate leadership qualities, particularly in business. Fifteen qualities emerged. Judgment, initiative, integrity, foresight, energy, drive, human relations skill, decisiveness, dependability, emotional stability, fairness, ambition, dedication, objectivity and cooperation. And nearly a third of the people who responded to the questionnaire thought these qualities were indispensable. However, the replies showed that the qualities named had no generally accepted meaning. They were all subjective evaluations. Also, in Effective Leadership, a press report from 1981 is quoted which relates to the selection of a new leader for the Penley lifeboat which had been lost at sea off the coast of Cornwall with a loss of some 16 lives, both on the lifeboat and on the coaster which had run into difficulties. The replacement crew undertook a leadership assessment course to identify which would emerge as the most suitable leader in the situation. To quote Leslie Vipons of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, who were running the selection program, quote, it is up to them to indicate who they would like to lead them, and I am hopeful that I shall be able to ratify their selection and choice. This time we have an example of subjective assessment by a group taking into account the context 
of the leader's situation. Well, Ralph Stockdale at the University of Ohio carried out a number of studies on leadership qualities and he asked the question, quote, does the leader exceed the ability of the average member of his or her group in terms of intelligence, scholarship, dependability in exercising responsibility, social and activity participation and socio-economic status? An interesting question, if a rather complex one. One key conclusion of Stogdill's work was that the situation played an important role in terms of determining the most appropriate qualities required by the leader. So before moving on to the next slide, just give some thought to the following study question. What difficulties could you envisage in using a purely qualities approach to leadership selection in your organization or one that you know well? Now in slide four we're going to have a look at the psychological aspects of leadership traits. Psychologists have always had a keen interest in leadership over the years, particularly in the early part of the 20th century, and they've attempted to make a more scientific approach to the issue of leadership qualities in terms of identifying specific leadership traits which it is hoped may be qualified more precisely. Now this idea of trying to get scientific with psychology actually reflects the way that psychology developed as a subject from what really was initially a sort of philosophical approach to understanding the human condition such as the work of William James of Harvard University back in the 1890s and it was really Skinner who got into the behavioral side of the human condition with his work on rats and Thorndike on one trial learning so it's not surprising that the psychologists started to try to get more scientific about the study of leadership and in particular they started to focus on this issue of traits. Well a commonly used definition of a trait is as an enduring characteristic for observed regularities, patterns and if you like consistencies in behaviour rather than the behaviour itself. And there seems to be a link between the concept of a quality and a trait and it's argued that traits may be acquired and the Dictionary of Psychology gives a number of types of trait including acquired, compensatory, inherited and dominant. Richard Duft's book on leadership explores the concept of leadership traits in some depth and is listed in the bibliography to this session. Well, many traits emerge only in certain cir situations and circumstances and a number of psychological tests will discriminate between a characteristic which is an inbuilt one within the individual and one which is a response to a situation. Public speaking ability is just one such characteristic whereby the individual may feel confident in one situation but not another. I know in my own case that I've spoken to several thousand people at a big convention uh, in America and yet if I'm asked to read a lesson in my local church with 10 people in the congregation that frightens me. Las Vegas did not frighten me and that's typical for most of us. We're confident in some situations, we have some traits that work for us in some situations and and yet in other situations we find life is very difficult. And that's what the psychology of leadership traits is really all about. What are the characteristics of this individual and how do they link to certain situations? So before moving on to the next slide, just give some thought to the following study questions. What characteristics do you possess as a person which vary between different situations? For example, in which type of situation do you display confidence and in which type do you lack confidence? Now in slide 5 we focus again on the interaction between the leader and the situation. And one of the more significant researchers in the middle of the 20th century on leadership was W.O. Jenkins and he summarized some 72 books on leadership. And he quoted, leadership is specific to the particular situation under investigation. Who becomes the leader of a particular group engaging in a particular activity and what characteristics are in the given case are the function of the specific situations. And that was quoted by him in his summary of these 72 books on leadership. Well, the whole business of leadership and the situation and the interaction has become a model for leadership selection. And W.O. Jenkins published this 
idea in a review of leadership studies with particular reference to military problems in the psychological bulletin back in 1947, volume 44. And he again points to the importance of understanding the interaction between the leader and the situation. Leadership is specific to the situation and it all depends on the situation who really is the natural leader of a group. Now this situational approach to leadership has produced a number of interesting models for leadership selection by really putting people into difficult and challenging situations of many types, both physical and mental. And it's been used extensively by the military, by the police and government service as well as in the private sector. So before moving on to the next slide, please give some thought to the following study questions. Can you identify one situation where you personally were successful as a leader and one where you were not successful? What factors in the situation caused the difference in performance? The idea of situational leadership has been turned into some very interesting fictional drama to make the point and in slide 6 we focus on what we call the Admirable Crichton effect. Now this is a classic film and it's all about the concept of emergent leadership driven by the situation. And it makes the point very strongly that social position does not determine leadership effectiveness. Well, the Admiral Crichton effect is based on the story of a play written by J. M. Barry in 1902, and it was later turned into a film, which is still available on DVD from Amazon. And the story is based on an upmarket family with a very, very plush mansion and servants, including a butler, Crichton, and this was uh, played in the film by Kenneth Moore. The social roles are well defined and Crichton is very subservient in the way he deals with his master, the lord of the house. All is stable and well defined in terms of status for Crichton. The family decide then to take a vacation on their family yacht and this becomes shipwrecked during a storm. The family makes it to the shore and the lord of the house attempts to take command with the situation with Crichton still playing the servant. Well, as time goes by, it becomes very clear that the master does not have the knowledge or skills to forage for food and create the necessary shelter for the family. And after a number of comic attempts where Crichton simply does what he is told, the roles start to reverse and Crichton ends up as the leader in the situation. He, in fact, becomes a very clear example of an emergent leader caused really by the situational pressures. And in the final stages of the film, Crichton is shown as the governor of the island on which they've been shipwrecked, and the former lord and master of the house becomes his servant and butler. And although it's a fictional example of role reversal, it does point to the concept of emergent leadership driven by the situation. Social position and wealth alone are not enough to provide effective leadership in a situation where practical skills, knowledge and common sense are required. So before moving on to the next slide, just give some thought to the following study question. Have you encountered any examples of the Admirable Crichton effect, namely emergent leadership driven by the context and the situation? Give some thought to that question before moving on. So we've seen in the idea of the film of the Admirable Crichton that situations can trigger latent leadership ability. That's exactly what happened to Crichton in the film Admirable Crichton. Well, is this a basis for selection in leadership? Is it a basis for developing leaders? Well, many organisations and assessment centres use the group approach to selection to see which person in a group emerges as a leader in each of the situations in which they are placed. In Crichton's case, he was the only individual with the required knowledge and skill set, so he had no real competition. In the modern organisational setting, however, there will inevitably be a range of participants and the emergent leadership idea can provide a useful way of selecting individuals with leadership ability relevant to the work of the organisation.
Well, the caveat to this is that the situations need to reflect the real-life situations which the candidate is going to be handling. And many organizations, notably the military, use situations to develop leadership ability by placing individuals in challenging, ambiguous and sometimes very arduous situations. The argument for this is that resilience is a key characteristic needed by military leaders in the real world. Well, the criticism which is often levelled at the process is that it is somewhat hit and miss and produces tough people who can survive difficulty but not necessarily inspire others to follow effectively. So, before moving on to the next slide, just give some thought to these two study questions. To what extent do you think emergent leadership situations can develop effective leadership? And do you think that such situations do actually unlock latent leadership potential? A recent development of the idea of the leader interacting with the situation is something called leader member exchange or sometimes as we call it LMX and this is the relationship between the leader and the followers and the situation and the success of that relationship depends on the mutual acceptance of each other's roles of the leader and the follower accepting each other's positions if you like and the situation and the nature of the context has to be considered it is argued that like attends like and a facet explored by LMX is that leaders tend to form more productive relationships with people similar to themselves. Well, as we said, leader member exchange is a relatively new approach to understanding leadership. And in focusing on the relationship between each follower and the leader, it ends up with the idea that leaders will treat different followers in different ways. And it's covered in Richard Duff's book on leadership, page 47 to 49, in a very effective way. One very interesting point about leader member exchange is that leaders are often more successful leading individuals with characteristics similar to their own compared to individuals who are very different from themselves. And this has great implications for equality and diversity in a whole range of organizations. Some approaches to LMX, leader member exchange, focus on the nature of the work being carried out by the followers and the context in which leaders are operating and in which the events are taking place. So before moving on, just give some thought to this study question. Have you experienced situations where a leader has tended to treat different people in different ways, tending to favour individuals similar to themselves? Now, in order to finish off this session looking at leadership qualities and traits, we're going to have a look at the leadership strengths approach, which is very much a contemporary way of looking at leadership development. Hide not your talents, they for use were made. What's a sundial in the shade? That was a quote by Benjamin Franklin, really pointing out that we should focus on our talents as opposed to our weaknesses. Well, the leadership strengths approach was actually put together by Tom Rath and the Gallup organization, and the bibliography gives you a reference for you to follow up with that. And the idea is that it actually does focus on leadership strengths not weaknesses which need to be corrected. And people who focus on their strengths are six times as likely to be engaged in their work and be effective. People who focus on their strengths are also three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life in general. So it's related, this approach, to the current movement in positive psychology which focuses on the positive aspects of an individual rather than the negative ones and the leadership strengths model addresses issues such as being an achiever, adaptability, ability to command situations, connectedness, empathy and a comprehensive list of other attributes including woo, the ability to win others over. Now, full details of the program and assessment exercise can be obtained from http colon double forward slash sf2 dot strengthsfinders dot com forward slash frequently asked questions. So, your study question 
for this particular session is what do you believe are your strengths as a leader? Now to finish off this session, just a few words about the bibliography for session two. Firstly, Ralph Stogdill's book, Handbook of Leadership, is still a very significant tome and many of the things we've talked about with leadership traits and leadership qualities are covered very effectively in his book, both the 1974 version and more recent ones. John Adair's book, Effective Leadership, published by Gower in 1983, has some really good crisp concepts on effective leadership and although now it's a few years old it still covers the basic very well. And then if you want to move on to start thinking about more strategic approaches to leadership, his book Effective Strategic Leadership published in 2002 again is good. Frontiers of Leadership by David Surrett, this is very much a classic text, and Leadership by Richard Daft, published in 2008, is a very, very comprehensive, up-to-date look at leadership theory, particularly leadership member exchange and things like the whole business of leadership traits. And then finally, The Strengths Finder Concept by Tom Rath through Gallup Press, published in New York. Again, something that is very, very much worthwhile having a look at, and it's suggested that you do a Google search on Strengths Finder uh, just to actually see if you can find out more about that approach. That's the end of this session two, and we look forward to seeing you in session three.